And our first reading this morning comes from Mary Oliver. One or two things. I invite you into a moment of reflection to hear these words and to let them permeate you. Marinate in the poetry. Don't bother me. I've just been born. The butterfly's loping flight carries it through the country of the leaves delicately and well enough to get it where it wants to go, wherever that is, stopping here and there to fuzzle the damp throats of flowers and the black mud up and down it sings, frenzied and aimless, and sometimes for long, ridiculous, delicious moments, it is perfectly lazy, riding motionless in the breeze of the soft stalk of some ordinary flower. The god of dirt came up to me many times and said so many wise and delectable things. I lay on the grass listening to his dog voice, crow voice, frog voice. Now, he said, and now, and never once mentioned forever, which has nevertheless always been like a sharp iron hoof at the center of my mind. One or two things. One or two things are all you need to travel over the blue pond, over the deep roughness of the trees and through the stiff flowers of lightning, some deep memory of pleasure, some cutting knowledge of pain. But to lift the hoof for that, you need an idea. For years and years, I struggled just to love my life. And then the butterfly rose weightless in the wind. Don't love your life too much, it said and vanished into the world. When I was in my mid-20s, I was working as a camp counselor at the Mountain Retreat and Learning Center in Highlands, North Carolina. It's a Unitarian Universalist retreat center. In my opinion, one of the most beautiful places in the world, a fantastic way to spend a summer in college. It's in North Carolina. One cool, damp, smoky mountain morning in early June, we stepped out of our cabins to find the mountain covered in luna moths. I'm not wearing my stole, oops. There we go. It, it left an impression on me. Uh, a luna moth is this sort of looks like this. It's a big green fuzzy moth. I think they're actually quite a bit bigger than this. They only really occur at night times when you see them most of the time, but rarely still. But today and in the day, covered all over the place, clinging to the sides of our cabin. Well, they have a wide range, but I was still quite surprised. The elementary school kids were with us on the mountain for that week, and they marveled at the moths. Well, at least the kids who weren't afraid of them. I mean, all these little green bugs, little girls, what are they? They weren't flying though. Clearly something is off. Here's this nocturnal bug, bug clinging to the walls of our cabin, some crawling slowly, some laying on the ground. They were passing on, having completed what they had set out to do, propagating the species. One of the kids in my cabin asked what they are doing and why aren't they flying at the time? I didn't really know what to say to a young child about the mating habits of moths or the fact that silk moths adult forms only have a vestigial mouth so they, so they can't eat. It kind of seems cruel. It makes nature seem really cold. This is what happens though, a cycle of life and death so that the adults and the offspring don't compete for food among many other reasons, no doubt, but, but why death? Other members of Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths that come up to you and say, don't love your life too much and then vanish into the world. They go on and survive. Why do these so beautiful pass on? We speak much of nature's beauty and the wisdom we can glean from her study. We perhaps don't give as much time to those aspects of the more than human world that are just stupefying, right? Evolution, this process of natural selection, expressions of genes being selected for based off adaptation and environment is not exactly kind to their children. It's not survival of the fittest. It's just a matter of whether an adaptation helps a species survive or at least not hinder its life cycle. So it's not the individual or the species. At some point, the genome of the luna moth and other silk moths changed to not have mouths. And as this adaptation did not hinder their ability to pass on genetic information, these moths let go of what they did not need. 
what was not useful for them and in doing so they take to the air to dance with the moon and fall back into forever it is a tragic and beautiful affair and yet we might struggle to parse our ideas about death our fears about it our anxieties about it with these realities it is a strange experience was a strange experience to be surrounded by all this co-mixture of beauty and tragedy and just the weirdness of the world especially with very young children now what could a moth know of its own mortality i i don't know <laughs> less than a human i hope i imagine it has an experience of the world all mothified compound eyes pheromone sweets on the midnight air all that fluttering dust and fur beneath the moon i can only imagine i reckon it's good to imagine though right offering ourselves a window to empathize with the more than human world to seek the poetry of nature and in doing so perhaps learn something about living and dying. The moth does not think of its death, if it could be said to think at all, only the impulse, the moment. They spoke of now, never once mentioning forever. Experiencing through the lens of its body, it has no concept of a concept, much less one like mortality. We are not so lucky or cursed, depending on your perspective, to be so blissfully unaware of our trajectory. Burdened and blessed as we are by this a miracle of emergent consciousness, we prefer not to think about death and dying. It's not a polite thing to do. It's not economically productive. It can make us sad and anxious, but I reckon, I reckon we may be able to find ourselves in a place where the consideration of that, of death, while it may never be comfortable, may at least not lead us into a disquieted, lonely fear. Life and death are not enemies. The physical and the spiritual are not opposites. They are partners. The moth goes so that the caterpillar may grow and furthermore feeds the ground. The scavengers participating in this impolite, sometimes gross yet ever present flow of ecology. So it is for the moth. So it is for us. It can be hard to find comfort in the presence of, presence of such a huge entangled thing. While the gospel written in the leaves and lives of green and growing things may only occasionally lead us to uh, take off your shoes, you are on holy ground energy. This may still be a source for that unitive experience, that oneness of everything feeling that is so central to so many mystical wisdom traditions. Nature for the wonders and the oneness, our neighbors for the comfort and companionship. We need, yes, we need one another as we lead one another home. Is it nature? Is it nurture? Why not both? I didn't know what to say to that child on the mountain, probably muttering something in an attempt to soothe or fix a feeling. Today, I like to think that I would invite silence, mouthless as the moth, listening, attending to the interplay of life and loss, beauty, and becoming more than the bounds of bodies, the limits of longing, life and death, and the next thing. Such a reflection might invite some complicated mixed feelings, feelings we may not have a good word for, sorrow and wonder all at once, awe and anxious turnings all at once. Such feelings are often challenging because they invite us to change, to live our lives with a greater intention, to be here with a deeper gratitude for this life that we do have and the ones we share it with. Responsibility to the ones we share this world with responsibility to maintain our humanity amidst the horror. Who are the helpers in Gaza doing what they can as the war machine grinds on? They are there. Who are the helpers in Ukraine as they continue enduring Russian aggression and hostilities? They are there too. When legislators in Nebraska push legislation that threaten to make being homeless a crime, where are the helpers? When legislators try to Restrict the sacred rights we have to our bodies. Where are the helpers? They are here. Some of them are literally right here in this room. They are here and they are there. In the midst of grief, in the midst of loss, in the shifting light of great transformation, and indeed this world is changing, maybe you didn't notice. I'm sure you did. Nonetheless, may we turn to our breath. The, mouth ha the moth has no mouth to eat, but it does breathe. With each breath, May we make room for grief, knowing that even as we make room for grief, we make room for joy. With each breath, may we make room for more helpers. With each breath, we, may we make room in our lives to become such helpers. Seek the wisdom of the moth, my friend, only for a short time. 
who knows not to love their life too much, who lets go of what does not serve them and takes to the moon for beauty, for coming to hear and to feel that pulse of life. And when the time comes to return transformed back into the mystery. Amen. Blessed be. Where do you seek change, friends? Many Unitarian Universalists seek to change this world with their love, their acts of justice and kindness, living like an embodied prayer to see the tides turn towards a better world. Perhaps it's something more personal, more unique to you, a behavior, a habit, some physical, amen, some physical element of the body. Perhaps we can't quite put a finger on where or what it is we seek to alter, but I imagine the better part of folks are after some kind of change in life, right? Otherwise, what is the point? To be a fixed, static thing forever, once and for always is to be a dead thing. What makes our tradition a living tradition is our adaptability and willingness to grow and to change. Few things change quite like this, though. It's no wonder that the butterfly, the moth, the order Lepidoptera has been so central a symbol in the quest of spiritual awakening, a sign of enlightenment, so closely associated with things like Easter. No doubt soon enough, these will be flying about us in the world, on the wind, now, I titled this sermon, The Gospel According to Nature, something to that effect. And so by this, I mean, by the study and the observation of the more than human world, one may find new ways to live and to be and to grow and become <clears throat> in this world, in this one. Now, last week, we spoke about how we might reframe the idea of us being a like, oh, we're a spiritual being having a physical experience. What if we're just spiritual beings having a physical experience and physical beings having a physical experience? Excuse me. Yeah, what if it's just all one is what I mean to say, that this is a spiritual experience when you know that things like this exist in the world. We might know what happens, and I'm going to get into that a bit because I'm not an entomologist, uh, not yet at least. But nonetheless, when I see this, the poet in me, the just sees the magic of the world being realized in real time. So what is happening? What made me glean from this? Well, a caterpillar comes out of its egg and it just starts to eat. Perhaps you remember The Hungry, hungry, hungry Caterpillar, a good book. It gets, some, gets a few things wrong. I, I reckon it may have misled many a person as to the, the, the underworkings of the pupil stage in particular. And so, yes, the caterpillar eats, perhaps eats your garden. I am sorry. Pick them off. Don't kill them. We do need them. But they eat and they eat and they eat and they eat. And when the time is right, depending on what kind of caterpillar they are, if they're a, a moth caterpillar, like the ones we were talking about on the mountain, silk moths, they will wrap silk around themselves and sometimes stick leaves and stuff to their cocoon and they will lay in the ground, underground, hide in a tree until the time is right. Caterpillars of butterflies do what the caterpillar of this monarch butterfly did. It's wild. They emit enzymes that harden their skin, they harden their, let them shed their skin, harden it, and they sort of migrate up into the top of the, of the chrysalis. Totally different structure. Sometimes they're gold or silver or bright green like with a, with a monarch butterfly. A truly stunning array of colors and shapes and sizes. And one has to wonder, what is the point of it being so <clears throat> spectacular? I don't know. I don't know. I'm reminded of the question Robert Maul Kimmerer asks in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, about why asters and goldenrods are so beautiful together. Turns out they help attract pollinators. And it just so happens that we like the way they look together too sometimes. I don't know why they're so shiny, so brilliant, so whatever they are, but I do know what happens on the inside and it's wild. So the caterpillar is in the dark of its wound thing and its body begins to emit enzymes which break down its body into hemolymph, the OG bug juice. Imagine melting in the dark like that. <laughs> Do you know what's happening? As we asked before, does the caterpillar have any concept of a self? I don't know. But when I inject myself into that process, it seems wild and also a little bit familiar because it is true that sometimes things just change on us. 
It can be overwhelming. The world can turn on an instant. Our lives can turn on an instant. We can have a kind of meltdown of our own, right? Hopefully your bodies stay more or less intact through that process. Because we don't have the sort of magic that butterflies and caterpillars and moths do within the caterpillar. And this is what I find to be most striking. It's not as though they are melted, melted down into nothing and then ex nihil, from nothing, a butterfly just appears. No. There are imaginal disks, which is a fun word, which means these components, these pre-butterfly parts kind of slaughtered away inside of the caterpillar. Wings, y'all. A caterpillar has little teeny tiny wings on the inside of it, just a little bit past its neck usually. And these, of course, are the wings that will eventually be taken within that goo, that dark, to be fashioned into real wings that will really fly to antenna and legs and all of the parts of a butterfly kind of being assembled like a car inside of this structure. Something is happening in there, friends. Something new and also old is turning in the dark. I reckon when we find ourselves in our own little meltdown places in life, we might feel like we are losing it and nothing is ever gonna make us whole or right again. We might not quite know what we're being made into, but we are always becoming. In our smaller communities, in the context of the world, the little joys and terrors of our time, it is all too one, friends, all too real. I wish there was more comfort to say that maybe you wouldn't experience this uncertainty, but you most certainly will. All of us will. Even me. Maybe even especially me. I don't know. But I reckon what really matters is how we move with this change. Not to rush it or reach for it too hard, but to practice a kind of patience that is not leaning away, but leaning into the areas in our life where we are having that sort of longing to change. Now, I would be a hypocrite if I said this is easy. It is not easy at all. But we're not here for easy all the time. We're here for love and we're here for good. And sometimes these things are challenging. Sometimes these things are a matter of melting in the dark, waiting for our time, taking in what we need from the world, but I reckon realizing, y'all, that what we really need to change is already inside of us. The imaginal disk of your heart, whatever that looks like, whatever that's shaped like, whatever that feels like for you, there is something in your life waiting to bloom. I can't tell you what it is, or necessarily pluralistic here, it could be so many things, so many things. But when you are ready, and you feel the call to move towards the side of love, to move towards more kindness for yourself and the stranger, towards more open-hearted living, knowing that you're not going to get it right once and for all and for always, that we will have to come back and try again. And the curiosity inside you wakes up and wonders about the lives of our neighbors, even those we may disagree with tremendously, not to say that we do not meet people in the interlocution of ideas, like we do struggle. We struggle against injustice, y'all. This is Nebraska. Look at the legislator. I mean, they are literally trying to make it a crime for homeless people to exist on the street. This state, this town, all parts of this world are crying out for change are crying out for the new. Something new is waiting to be born, y'all. I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I imagine it happens something like this, right? As so many great changes do, where we're going about our business and then the signal hits us, something like that. And then next thing you know, we're being sort of melted into the dark and something new happens. It, to me, it kind of reminds me of ministerial formation. I was just minding my own business one day and I'm like, I was a youth minister at the time, maybe this is the year I actually go to seminary. And then you do. And then COVID happens and you're in a chrysalis and you're melting. <laughs> oh, goodness. But then something changes. I'm not even suggesting I'm fully out of that chrysalis yet, y'all. I'm still waiting to be born, still struggling through it right along with y'all. We're always in the process of becoming. I don't know if we ever really get to take to the air all the time, but I know that the promise of transformation is ever present ever present, as present as our inherent worth and dignity, which we don't have to earn, we just have for the sake of being here. 
that principle of transformation that we're exploring this month isn't just a simple idle change. It is an accumulation of many, many, many changes, many attempts failed and otherwise to seek a more radical transformation that lets us take on more that shape of love, letting go of what no longer serves us, recognizing that what we need to transform, to be who we're called to be is already within us, but that we must also take in, keep taking in, keep reaching out, participating in the flows of relationship, the flows of real ecologies, in the relationships and the ecology we kind of have going on here and in your own life and in your own relationships. These all add up to something greater, friends. Like all the imaginal disks of our lives building us into something new. What is that? And I invite you, I wish discernment for you, friends. I wish curiosity for you. And the ability to, once you know what's happening, to be a good steward of the power of transformation in your life that you may take it out into the world to love this world into the shape of healing. Amen and blessed be.